In this chapter, we're going to talk a little bit about how the rise of the Industrial Revolution affected the mass production of printing. So whereas people before now were living in more rural communities, the production of goods in larger factories helped to result in a concentration of people mostly in, in cities. This led to a rise of a mass culture, and because of this mass culture, people were trying to reach out to the masses with their offerings or their products, which also actually included the arts. And so because of this, people were trying to find a way to print more although perhaps the printing quality would have suffered a little bit, but now printing was not just a privilege for the wealthy and the elite. The cost of production came down in general, and because of the mass circulation, the potential for advertising support also went up. The significance of the moment is difficult to overstate, but it was the greatest improvement since printing was invented. Other things that were happening in the Industrial Revolution were the invention of the steam engine, railroads, coal, iron, and steel. And we're going to talk a little bit about Friedrich Koenig, who was a mechanical engineer who invented the power press that first was able to print the London Times by steam. So in 1814, Friedrich Koenig was able to automate the process a little bit, which in turn created more respect for his workers. People weren't using as much physical labor to produce the printed materials. So, Part of what was revolutionary about Koenig was that he was able to free the press from financial dependence on specific political parties. And because of this mass rapid spread of information, this led to having more of a democracy in politics. Now that printing was so much more affordable, this also benefited the businesses. In 19th century England alone, 2,000 periodicals would sometimes print off up to 200,000 copies each. The invention of mass printing was also in demand so that the creators of products and other industries could spread the word through advertisement in these periodicals. The invention of this particular printing press allowed a crew of six men to produce 1,100 pages on both sides per hour, which was four times the efficiency of previous printing methods. Now this is a photograph of the rotary steam press, which was invented by Richard M. Ho. Now this machine was even more efficient and it allowed millions of copies of a page in a single day. The mass production of printed works flourished after we started to use rolled paper and this continuous feed of paper allowed the presses to run at an even faster pace. This smaller printing press was made by Stephen P. Ruggles of Boston and it's called the Card and Billhead Press. It is the first of many treadle powered plate machines. It is mechanized but not powered by steam, but it eventually was able to transform driving printers and it also helped to increase productivity. They also contributed to the expansion of letterpress printing even though lithography was coming up to play. Now because of the mass production of printing leading to a more democratic society, people still had to be careful of censorship. However, people like Charles Philippon were creating satirical images and drawings that were criticizing the government. Philippon had to be very careful because if he were caught, he could face huge fines or punishments for speaking out against the repressive government at the time. Very humorously, in this image, we see Louis Philippe transformed into a pair called Le Poir. Trying to avoid punishment, Philippon claimed that anything can look like the king, 
and it was interesting because this image of the pair started to spread all over Paris at the time. Honoré Daumier was employed by Charles Philippon, and he was definitely one of the most notorious caricature artists of the time. This image here depicts uh, King Louis Philippe as Gargantua, uh, a name from a book written by Rabelais that was considered to be extremely crude, obscene, and vulgar. This was, of course, another social commentary, and this was an image that led him to become in prison for six months. <laughs> this image was hugely critical of the government as well as their financial backers. After 1835, Philippe and shifted their focus away from these provocative images, and they shifted gears, and they adopted French theater characters. These caricatures were bringing to everyone's attention what was essentially happening at the time. There were a lot of advertisements, there was a lot of pressure on citizens to purchase things, and there was a lot of corruption in the government, corruption in business practices, and a lot of people felt that modern life was indecent and difficult and that there wasn't enough appreciation. It's also interesting to note that at this time in the Industrial Revolution there was something very wonderful that was as a result and this is that women were able to get more financial independence, they were able to break free. Now that there was such a demand for workers they were often called in to work in the factories and they had a lot of opportunities to create this independence uh, through retail as well, and this was the start of dramatic political and social change. This is when women decided that they were working, so they also deserved the rights to vote and to own property. So this definitely, this change in urban life helped to fuel social changes as well. In a counter to the industrial lifestyle where people were feeling that they were taken advantage of and they were struggling to make a living, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in 1848 published their critique of this industrial society called Manifesto of the Communist Party. Uh, their assertion was that capitalism was the root of an unsustainable economic system and what they thought should be a replacement would be socialist or communist societies. What is so remarkable about this is that we are now seeing that design is a catalyst for social change and the other thing that is interesting is that people were starting to see design as something that could beautify all of the industrial world around them. So this was potentially going to provide people hope in such a dark and cloudy world. In this next slide we're going to talk a little bit about chromolithography, uh, mechanized letterpress, as well as lithography techniques for printing. Uh, as you can see this is where we're starting to see color in the prints. Lithography was a technique that had been invented in the late 18th century by Alois Senefelder and this was a inexpensive way of reproducing scripts and he used a chemical process to transfer the images or actually draw them onto limestone and then reproduce them very inexpensively. Eventually in the 1880s, halftone was created, which is in the upper left corner, and this was what allowed photographs to be transferred through photolithography to speed up the process of printing even more. Chromolithography was a method that made multicolor prints, and of course this stemmed from the original black and white lithography, and when it is used to reproduce photos, it is called making a photochrome. So at this point there was still a popularity of hand coloring because when this process was used there would be a different chromolithograph piece of limestone for each color involved. 
so they were layered on top of each other to create a composite image with all the colors of the image. One of the most important inventions was photography, and this was discovered simultaneously by Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre, uh, who was born in 1787, as well as William Henry Fox Talbot, uh, who was born in 1800. So what we're looking at right here is a daguerreotype, and this was one of the first types of successful photography. This is Abraham Lincoln. And making these types of photographs was not an easy feat. The models would often have to pose for a very long period of time before they could get created. So, of course, not the most economical option available. So though at this time photography had been invented, they were not widely used until the 1920s, which was several decades after its invention, uh, but a lot of photographs at this point were still uh, presented as what engravings. So this is a photo of Gleason's pictorial drawing room companion. Uh, this was a 19th century illustrated periodical, and this came from Boston, Massachusetts. Frederick Gleason founded this magazine in 1851. And after 1855, it became Ballou's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion. And here is a color image from Franklin College in Athens, Georgia, USA, from the periodical. So you can see what that looks like. And the importance of these newspapers was that they were a mixture of news, entertainment features, fiction, and poetry, and they depended on wood engravings to produce the illustrations. So there are a lot of photographs in the work, but yet these could also be printed very quickly and every run was at least a hundred thousand copies. This is also one of the first times that we are seeing justified columns. So you can see the neat division into three parts of the columns on the pages. So seeing an image like this is what shows us the first beginnings of graphic design as we know it, alignments and balance in the page, uh, proportion of images and image size to the text, alignment, and that sort of thing. So we're seeing all of these, these features come together on the page very nicely. And here we have an image by Lady Mary Georgina Filmer who was an early proponent of the art of photographic collage. Now, while this was not a mass-produced image, and we're not going to see breakthroughs in the photo collage until much later on, what's interesting to note is that this was still a recognized technique, and it was still part of the creative sphere at the time. This was something that had occurred to people to create, although we just hadn't had the technology yet to produce this on a mass level. So these photo montages were created by the Victorian socialite and she has painted them in watercolor and what is cool is that we are seeing a piece of a woman's life in an era where a lot of the achievements of men are more celebrated and these uh, were also added, so in addition to the watercolor in the background, she also added cutouts from albumin silver prints. So those are the photos that you're seeing more in the foreground. And in this image she's positioning herself next to the Prince of Wales. And he is portrayed very large in this photograph and she has been known to be very flirtatious with him. And who is much smaller in the image is Sir Edmund Filmer who is her husband right over here and he is seated next to the pet dog so this um, image is now shown in the Metropolitan Museum of Art 